Nope. Well, it's good to see all of you here this evening. We, uh, uh, it's been, what, a couple uh, services since I've been able to be here with Courtney and Dean having COVID, so they, uh, they're doing a lot better, uh, have made improvement, and uh, should be here with us on Sunday. But uh, I'm glad to be back with you all and continuing our study in the Bible together. Uh, Wednesday nights, we've been studying through the book of Isaiah, and that's where we'll be studying together tonight. We uh, have been working through chapter 29, and we've gotten down to about verse 17, so we'll continue through the end of the chapter and then get into chapter 30 as well. But in chapter 29, as we were going through, we noticed, you know, God speaking to Jerusalem. And as he often did through the prophets, he, he spoke warning them about the consequences that were coming and the, the judgment that would be upon them. And that's what the chapter begins with, woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. And that's a, a name that is used for Jerusalem, uh, the name Ariel, literally meaning hearth of God. And there's a sense in which God's people would be sort of placed on an altar and essentially be, be judged or burned, so to speak. And he speaks about that in the first four verses. At verse 5 then, we noticed uh, last time we looked at this that there was a shift to uh, looking at the enemies of God's people. So they, they were going to be judged and God would use enemy nations to judge them. However, then God would turn around and because those nations themselves were deeply flawed and in sin, He would bring judgment upon them. So that would take place and that is discussed all the way down through verse 8. And so at verse 9, then it gets back to a picture of the people having spiritual blindness, uh, spiritual intoxication, as it were, not having uh, an awareness of where they were spiritually, ability to think clearly. They were all far from God in their thoughts, in their minds. And as a result, uh, God was going to again uh, bring judgment. We notice too, verse 13 is a verse that Jesus uh, quotes in Matthew chapter 15 uh, in verses 8 and 9 where it says, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. And then the next verse, verse 14, Paul quotes 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 19. You might recognize these words. Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, and then, it, and then specifically this part, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. So this, this was going to be a time where God's judgment would be upon His people. The ones that they respected and looked to for guidance and spiritual instruction would have nothing to offer them. They themselves would would fade away, their influence would fade away. Uh, but uh, it was a problem then that Jesus also had to deal with during His time. And that's simply the spiritual uh, immaturity and also uh, just withering away of God's people that happens and it happens throughout the ages. It's happened again and again where God's people no longer truly know Him no longer really walk in His ways. I mean, they, they're aware of Him and they would claim to worship Him and follow Him as the Jews often did. However, the reality was that they did not know God and they were not following Him. There was a, an acknowledgement of that or profession of that as if it was real, but it wasn't. And in fact, what they were following were the teachings of men, the doctrines or commandments of men. And that's, that's where we go wrong over and over again throughout history, uh, human beings, and even, of course, within the church as well, we are certainly capable of either knowing God and being faithful to Him or veering away off into various directions as a result of influence that comes upon us. And that influence can be from many different sources, uh, but those influences essentially take us away from what the Scriptures actually teach to other things, whether it be various uh, religious leaders within the church that have turned away, whether it be denominational influences, all sorts of things, whether it be the worldliness and uh, uh, 
the various things of the world and the society in which we live that can influence people, and they, they expose themselves so much to worldliness while at the same time not spending much time at all, if any, with God's Word on a personal basis themselves, aside from showing up and punching their ticket at service, so to speak, uh, and that, that cannot sustain spirituality and growth and advancement and maturity to where people become themselves teachers of God's Word, are living a life consistent with what the Bible teaches, so that both Word spoken and life lived consistently together form a powerful influence for good upon others. But instead, oftentimes people become more and more just resembling like the world and what they're surrounded by. Uh, that's, that's a tragic thing, but it happens so easily because uh, we don't intentionally make plans and put into practice what we know we must do in order to be what we have to be in order to please God. Uh, so the people here were in that kind of spiritual condition. But that, of course, can all be changed. It doesn't have to be that way. It just takes a mindset and a determination to first examine self, uh, be humble and uh, willing to acknowledge where we are spiritually and compare ourselves to what the Bible says as opposed to what other people are doing, uh, you know, because that's a tragic and, and dangerous uh, measure. Never measure yourself based upon what you see around you. That can include in the church as well because you need to know based upon what God's Word says that you are exactly where you need to be so that then you can help others who are not. But uh, here, these people then uh, were warned by God again at verse 15, Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? So they, they, uh, the people made plans, and they didn't consider God's will. And a part of this was their plan to, we're going to go join forces with Egypt. They will help us against the Assyrians. That wasn't going to work. Uh, God says in verse 16, Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, He did not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, He has no understanding? And so, tragically, the people didn't have the fear, the respect of God that they should have. It was as if they thought they could do whatever they wanted to without any consequences that God somehow wouldn't see, wouldn't acknowledge, wouldn't... Uh, do anything uh, when they turned away from his will. So then, and we mentioned this at the end of our study last time, that beginning at verse 17, he looks far forward into the future, into the time when Christ would come and the gospel would be preached and great changes would take place, wonderful things for the world, of course, with the coming of the Savior, the establishment of the church, and the hope given to humanity through what Christ did and, and the sacrifice that he made and that truth being proclaimed. And so that's what we're going to get into for the reign of our study together and look at what uh, Isaiah presents here as a picture of the days to come and the hope and the joy and the good things that are in the future and what God will do, how he'll take action at various times and uh, the, good, the good days that are in the future of those who love the Lord. So let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer together here, and then we'll get into the remainder of the chapter beginning at verse 17. Let's bow. Our loving Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for the rich blessings you bestow upon us each and every day, and we're so thankful, Father, for this time that we can come and open your word and reflect upon the choices made by your people long ago, and your words to them. And we know, Father, that as your own holy men in the New Covenant period said, that these things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And so as Paul said, Father, we look to these words. We know that there is much to draw from them because our mistakes, our sins, our our straying from what is right is a pattern that humanity falls into over and over again. And the cure, the solution is always the same, to return to you and to give heed to your words, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
and to be sure that we every day, Father, draw closer to you and continue to grow by spending time deeply looking into your word, meditating upon it, that we might be like that tree planted by the rivers of water that bears fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. We thank you, Father, for the power of your word and for the way that it does, in fact, encourage us, strengthen us, help us through each day as we have to face a world that is so far from you. But, Father, we're grateful for your heeding our prayers and for the privilege of prayer that we have. We thank you at this hour for all who are present as we're able to assemble this evening. We pray, Father, thanking you for all of our visitors who are with us and pray that you would be with them in all their travels as they travel about in this area and when they head back to their homes that you give them safety. We pray, Father, your blessings upon your people throughout this world that are part of that remnant that cling to you and with all their hearts love you and seek to walk in your ways. And we thank you, Father, for all that you bring us through in this life. We know that we have to face many times hardships, sufferings, various trials to our faith, but we know you are still always there with us and will help us through those things. And we pray, Father, that you would help us always to have hearts that are deeply concerned about the souls around us that are yet outside of the body of Christ, that have not yet been baptized into that spiritual kingdom. And we pray, Father, that you would help us in our own efforts to speak forth the words of truth and to do so with love and sincerity and compassion for those who are in need, that we would be patient with all men, that we would lovingly convey your truth and warn people that they must repent of their sins and turn to you and accept your truth and that you will save them and cleanse them, give them hope and things to, to live for and even to die for and that in the end, heaven will be our home with you. And Father, we thank you for the examples of those who live just in that way. We can look to them and we can see how they overcame what they did and how you helped them and be encouraged, Father. And we thank you for the prophet Isaiah and for all that we learn from the things that the Holy Spirit revealed to him. I pray your blessings upon us this hour as we study. We pray, Father, for all of our sick and those with various illnesses that are still working through them and, and uh, having treatments and various matters that they're tending to with their physicians, and we pray for their improved health. We pray, Father, that they would be able to be back with us again, those who are unable to presently. We pray also for those who've lost loved ones, that you comfort them and be with them. And we pray, Father, that you would help us always as your people to have love and compassion for all souls, both in and out of the church, that we would do good as we have opportunity and be a people zealous for good works. We thank you, Father, for the freedoms that we enjoy and the blessings we have in this nation and the prosperity that we enjoy as well. Father, we know that even those among our nation with very little have so much more oftentimes than those in many places of the world. And we give thanks for you, Father, for also the opportunities we have to show care when we can help others who are in need in times of distress and loss. And we pray, Father, that doors of opportunity might be open for us to communicate the gospel to the salvation of souls. Father, we pray that you forgive us when we fall short and strengthen us where we are weak and help us always to live each day prepared and ready as we look forward, Father, to your son's return one day. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Okay, so let's, let's read here in Isaiah 29, beginning in verse 17. Uh, we'll read a few verses uh, down through verse 21 and look at what Isaiah is saying. Now, there in verse 17, he says, Is it not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, 
and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to nothing, the scornful one is consumed, and all who watch for iniquity are cut off, who make a man an offender by a word, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and turn aside the just by empty words. So a number of things are communicated here, but again, these things, and this also you'll see in the remainder of, in 22, 23, and 24, also gives us this indication that this is a look forward into a time when uh, God would bring about wonderful things for His people in the future. And we know that, you know, we would have the, uh, the people going off into captivity, Israel, the northern kingdom, carried off by the Assyrians, but then Judah, later on in their history, carried off as well by the Babylonians. After the 70 years, they come back to the land of Israel, or the southern kingdom of Judah, and they, they're able to uh, rebuild and restore worship, uh, but they, they still, as we know from the minor prophets, though idolatry is never an issue again, they still fall into practices where uh, the truth, the law of Moses given to them, is not faithfully being followed. And so they veer away in, in what they're doing and violate the will of God. But uh, down centuries later, when Christ comes into the world, there is a, a radical change because of the entrance of the Messiah into the world. And at that point in time, there's like a light that shines in a place of darkness. And really what you're reading here in uh, these verses as it relates to the blind and those who cannot hear, it's very similar to what Jesus communicates in Matthew chapter 4, or what is, you know, what he, he says, but also it's, it's truly about him. These words uh, fulfill his entrance into the world and what he would accomplish. Uh, but the, the narrative here given by Matthew, beginning at verse 12 of Matthew 4, it says, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. We know that Jesus, his ministry, focused a great deal in that region of Galilee. Uh, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions, notice, of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So they, they uh, Jesus at that point began his ministry, began to preach the gospel, and call upon people to repent, for the kingdom of heaven, he said, is at hand. So this is where light comes in. This is where these words that are spoken concerning the deaf and the blind would be coming to pass. So, and again, you look at verse 17 when the prophet says, is it not yet a very little while? Well, in the overall scheme of things and from the vantage point of God who gives these words to humanity, time is, a, a, you know, time is such a, uh, a short thing with God and from a prophetic sense, of just looking into the future and seeing these are the things that are going to happen. It's as if they're already present, but he's speaking about them in the future. But he's giving a picture of what will be and the things that are going to happen. And so it's like presented as if not very far away till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field. And again, he's using imagery here. He's using word pictures to explain to them what is going to be. And it's pictured as a time of prosperity, fertility, things that are growing and things that are, um, as they would look out into their fields and see, wow, this is a great year. This is wonderful. We're prospering. They could look on their, uh, that which they had sown and see the harvest was going to be great. And it's a spiritual harvest that's under consideration here. Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed a forest. So wonderful prosperous, growing, fruitful times will be coming and God will bring what? Remarkable things to those 
who oftentimes are pity, who do not have what they long for. Uh, how many people who are deaf do not long to hear and those that are blind to be able to see? And that will come, he says. The day is coming. When you think about the, uh, the times that characterized many periods in Israel's history, it was a time of no understanding, a lack of understanding of God's Word. They were in darkness, spiritual darkness. And that would be true even after these words were spoken for a long time. Because, and that's really when, uh, in Israel's history, there developed you know, the Pharisees and all of the oral traditions and teachings that came from them that when they noticed the apostles weren't keeping those things, they were offended and they, they called Jesus out. Why aren't your disciples doing such and such and keeping the law and, and the words of the fathers? Well, all of that developed in a time when the people were in darkness. Hosea 4 and verse 6 uh, spoke of that. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They didn't know. They didn't understand God's will. But he's saying there would be a time coming when a light would shine. People who could not hear and didn't understand, they would understand. They would be able to hear. And the idea is they would hear and not be in darkness and have no idea what was being spoken. It would be explained to them. They would understand. They would long for that. They would seek after that. And those who could not see, again, as... It's a picture of the senses are dulled and, and men do not grasp what they see or what they hear. It doesn't make sense to them. And yet, one day he says, it will. That will all change. And then in verse 19, the humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Now there, uh, the Holy One of Israel has reference to deity. And of course, uh, Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5 about those who are poor in spirit. The meek shall inherit the earth and so forth. Uh, these things relate to a disposition of heart. Not people that are lifted up with pride and that are uh, arrogant in their hearts. That characterized some of the leaders during Jesus' day who had that kind of a lofty attitude, whereas... There were people that Jesus was able to reach as he proclaimed the gospel that had the opposite minds, that they were uh, spiritually impoverished and they knew it. They knew their dependence upon God. They knew their, the darkness that was in their life. They knew that they didn't have the spirituality that they should have. They knew there were a lot of things they didn't grasp, they didn't know, and they were grieved over that. Uh, Jesus, during his ministry and, and, the, and the labors of John the Baptist as well, uh, those efforts led to the reformation of lives, among which were some that oftentimes people would think, you know, those are, those are not people who care about spiritual things, but it was the tax collectors and the harlots. Now, these were people who uh, certainly were living sinful lives for the, you know, for their respective uh, reasons that they were, you know, guilty, the sins that they committed, but they responded to a call to repent, and they heeded the words of God. In every generation, uh, there are people who have come to understand, you know, they're not where they need to be. Perhaps they, in their hearts, have turned away from what they knew in the past, and they're no longer living that way, and through various events over numerous years in their lives, they realize, you know, I've, I've, I've gone in a direction I should never have gone. They're ready to come home. And, and there were various Jews who had turned away from God in, in serious ways, but that were willing and desired to come home to the Father. And Jesus represented one who was compassionate. He was compassionate. He called souls. He was a, he was a very powerful teacher, but he was also one that connected to the people in a way that made them understand that God cared about them and, and, and that they were, it would be accepted if they would come back to Him. You, we can see the parable, for example, of the prodigal son that Jesus taught. Uh, the father was eager and he ran to meet his son and, and what Jesus showed the people was that, you know, you, you, your father doesn't despise you because you went off and have lived in the far country of sin for a long time. He, he's been deeply concerned about you and he loves you and he wants you to come home. And that's the picture we need to help people to see, that God loves all, that God is there to 
to uh, keep putting the message out, look, you're not doing right. You've sinned and you need to come back to me. And the message is one of rebuke. Yes, that's, that's necessary. That's a part of it. But also hope, restoration, and cleansing, and a life that one then can li live working alongside God, being a faithful servant, and with joy awaiting, well, joy experienced in the forgiveness of sins initially, but then the hope of a joy and a peace that will never be taken away, and the inheritance that God has in store for His people. So these are the kinds of hearts that, that will uh, just be so filled with joy, the humble heart, the heart that is poor in the sense that they know that they themselves have nothing spiritually, they re rely completely upon God. These are the ones that will joy in the Lord, rejoice in the Holy One of Israel, verse 19, because uh, they will see God as one that, that they can reach out to and He will accept them and He will forgive them and everything will be okay. And so uh, that's where we need to be. That's where each and every one of us have to be. Again, it's a disposition of heart. It's a willingness to acknowledge our sins, come back to God, faithfully serve Him, and uh, do His will. And then in verse 20, there is the uh, mention of those who are going to be judged by God those whose ways are contrary to His will, just the opposite of the humble and the poor. Here are the terrible ones, he says, verse 20, for the terrible one is brought to nothing. So God will also in the future bring judgment. Now one of the things that we see again and again in Scripture is that though the Bible does speak about the final judgment, and that's, that's still in the future, that there have been and will be judgments by God against people at various times in history. God judged uh, His own people as a whole, the entire nation. God judged other nations that were not His people, but of course that were accountable to Him. All nations are accountable to Him. And this is something that we've seen already in the book of Isaiah, that God said, woe unto the, you know, the nation of Babylon or Assyria or Edom, uh, because God holds people accountable for the choices. But then also we've seen uh, at various points in God's will that He brings judgment upon uh, individuals as well. Uh, and even churches, right? Uh, the opening teaching in the book of Revelation shows that the Lord calls churches to return back to Him if they stray from their ways. And He warns them that if they don't correct things, their candlestick will be removed. So the Lord is gracious, the Lord is merciful, but those who cast Him off and do not turn to Him will not heed God. Though He lovingly calls out to them and tries to draw them back, then there are, there are going to be consequences. The terrible one is, notice, brought to nothing. The scornful one is consumed, and all who watch for iniquity are cut off. So these are the ones who, whose ways are given over to corruption. The terrible one. Here's the one who in great power has control. They do whatever they want to. They think no one can stop them. But eventually, their power will be brought to nothing. Now, there were people, again, think about this. The nation of Babylon had great power uh, in the world. They were, they were a mighty nation. They had many different rulers, many different leaders. Uh, then comes along uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and then Belshaz Belshazzar, uh, and they're brought low. Nebuchadnezzar is brought down by God and humbled. He essentially loses his mind for a period of time. And then Belshazzar as well sees the writing on the wall, and the kingdom departs from him. People think that, you know, if they can, if they can gain power and they can gain control and, and they can get enough people to stand with them, that they have everything locked in place, but God has a way of bringing to pass things to where the schemes of men and their workings that are evil and contrary to His will are brought to absolutely nothing. He may use them for a time to bring judgment, to accomplish judgment against those who do not do His will that need to be judged, and then He can turn around and say, you think you, this was all you're doing? You think you gained this power for yourself? And in fact, it was God who gave them that power and brought them to where they are, and then He humbles them and brings them down, and they're 
their might comes crashing down around them. And so this is, this is a lesson from history that men in general should heed, but often people in the world uh, are oblivious to what God has spoken because they have no regard or respect for His Word. Uh, the scornful one is consumed, so here are those who, who mock, who ridicule, and our, our world, our society here in this country is filled with all kinds of people and segments of society and groups who have nothing but scorn for what is right and what is good and holy and proper for God and His Word, for the values set forth in His Word, for the stand of right that we take in opposing evil and, and upholding what is good. The ways of God uh, are despised by many people in our society because we are modern and we are progressive and we've moved past all of that ancient, uh, you know, mindset and those ways that the Bible sets forth. And yet the ways of God are changeless. Uh, they, are, they are for every generation of people from the first century to this century and as many, many centuries as the world has. But uh, there are those who are scornful and God will judge them as well. They're consumed. And then look at this one. The end of verse 20. And all who watch for iniquity are cut off. So these are those who just, they have an eye for sin. They have an eye for that which is contrary to God's will. Uh, they're in favor of it. They support it. They uh, are trying to bring it to pass and, and empower it. They watch for iniquity. Uh, these are those who, it's like iniquity, sin, is like, you know, something that they can't wait till it arrives, you know, whatever it might be. You know, there are things that we watch for. You might watch for the return of a loved one. You might watch for a letter in the mail that you're expecting, something good, but they are watching for, and it's like anticipating with eager expectation, sin. Well, these are those who are going to be cut off. God will judge them. Verse 21, really the whole thing, it's all about basically individuals who cause others to turn away from God, to cause others to sin. Uh, he says, those who do what? Who make a man an offender by a word. Well, an offender is a sinner, one who offends or who goes contrary to God's will. By a word is by what you speak. You know, you say something, you teach, you communicate something. You turn one away from the truth. That's being done throughout every generation. There are those who have power, they have influence, they have sway over people. They don't walk in the way of God and then they speak words that essentially make others to become offenders because they lead them away from God. And what do they do? And lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. Now the gate is what all of the cities, you know, the, the typical cities of the time would have the gate where a lot of times the elders, the older men would be gathered together. It was a place where uh, individuals might come with questions and the older men would be there. And, and, uh, but, and, and that would be a place too where you would have correction, reproof. Uh, and yet those individuals who are correcting, who are approving, become now the targets. They're hated, they're despised because they represent something that those who live in sin oppose this way that you are teaching, this way that you advocate, and they don't want any part of it. Not only do they not want you to tell them what to do, they don't want you telling anyone or being an any influence upon anyone for good. And so the one who is a reprover in the gate, they will lay a snare for that person. In other words, they want to bring that person down. They want in some way to entrap that person, ensnare that person, cause that, some, that person to, to lose their influence, to, to lose their... Uh, uh, the place of respect that they have and so they, they try to entrap them and snare them, maybe cause them to fall or stumble in some way and say, look at this one who was trying to uh, influence people for God. Look, he doesn't even serve God faithfully. Well, so these are the ways of the wicked that God will judge. And then the final one in verse 21, it says, and turn aside the just by empty words. So again, here are individuals, and this really it takes my mind anyway to what we studied not long ago in Galatians in chapter 1, where Paul uh, lamented the fact that the Christians in Galatia 
had so soon departed from the truth that Paul had revealed to them and were embracing, he says, another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So there are individuals who, who will turn aside the just. So these, these brethren were just, they were doing God's will, they were faithful, but then these come along with what? Empty words. And the empty words, now, they don't seem so empty, right, when they're presented or people wouldn't follow them. They promise a lot, and they sound wonderful, and they have the appearance of something that is solid and, and big and, 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 and a great thing to be drawn to and, to and to commit to and be a part of, but it's empty. There's no substance to it. And that's true of everything, anything, that is not based upon God's Word, which is solid, rock solid, immovable, cannot be shaken. But men do not like what God says oftentimes, too narrow, too restrictive, doesn't offer the freedoms and whatever you want to do. Uh, it is very narrow and therefore rejected by many. So then there are exceptions that are made. There are uh, ideas and doctrines that amount to a perversion of the truth. And these are the empty words that then tragically many people hear uh, are deceived by and they are turned aside. All of such individuals that lead others astray, God's going to bring judgment upon them. And so we see the powerful pro proclamation of the gospel in the first century. And in fact, what happened, you had Jesus himself, a model of this kind of thing, correcting uh, the Pharisees. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he called them, because they were leading people astray. So powerfully, Jesus uh, initiated this kind of uh, confrontation with those who were, in fact, themselves far from God and leading others far from God. But here's a warning that Jesus gave. When the blind lead the blind, he says, both will fall into the ditch. It's a tragedy, but it's true. A person, every person has to give account of themselves to God. It's, it's fine, right, to, to uh, sit down before a teacher of God's Word and study together, but we can't just blindly accept everything we hear. That's how uh, we have no knowledge if we don't search out and verify and study the Scriptures and, and make sure that things are right. And uh, during the days of the first century, Jesus corrected so many false teachings, and then you had individuals like Stephen who opposed false teachers and those who uh, did not uphold the truth. And the Bible says, uh, at least concerning Stephen, that uh, they could not resist the spirit with, with which he spoke. He spoke powerfully. He spoke the truth. And they didn't know what to do with that. And so... Uh, God has, through the ages, opposed by His faithful servants those false teachings, those uh, individuals who, who do wrong contrary to His will, but, and, and that's what He does through His Word and His servants, but then He can also certainly bring judgment upon them as well in His own ways in terms of consequences that He brings upon lives. Uh, and then in verse... Verse 22 and 23 and 24, we see words spoken concerning uh, the house of Jacob, we're told, which is, you know, the, the people of God. But again, this, this has to do with things relating to spiritual Israel that will be coming. So it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. So this is the God that redeemed Abraham, gave him hope. And what is he speaking about? The house of Jacob. Now again, this is the uh, church. But it's a picture of Jacob, the patriarch, as if he's looking into the future and things are looking better. Because in the times, you know, we sometimes use this phrase, uh, you know, if your father could see you now, you know, he'd roll over in his grave, this type of thing. Uh, if Jacob could see the people during the times of Isaiah, he would be grieved. And uh, that was a sad thing. However, the future was coming to where 
it would not be that way. So look at what it says in the latter part of verse 22. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, nor his face now grow pale. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and the fear of the God of Israel. These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding, and those who complained will learn doctrine. So look at the change. God is saying, you know, if Jacob could see, his face, what? Will not now be ashamed. You know, if, you're, if your children turn away from God, you're ashamed of that. That brings shame. What does he say? His face shall not now grow pale. The idea of uh, grief and sorrow and just like a, an emptiness, you know, when, you're, when, you, when you become pale, it's like you, you lose the spirit within you. Uh, grief is there or some great distress, you know, when someone hears some news and they go pale. That's, that's a highly significant, sorrowful, moving something that they have heard. And when, when Jacob looks and he sees his people, his descendants, he won't be ashamed or grow pale. But instead, what is he going to see? The work of God, verse 23, that God has created a people. He's brought about a nation that respects him, that will hallow my name, he says. In other words, they have respect for God, fear of God, hold his name in reverence, and hallow the Holy One of, Is of Jacob, and, and, and fear the God of Israel. So they will have the heart that they have been needing to have all through these times and so often did not have, they would, they would be changed. Now this is not saying everyone and all people among God's, uh, among, among uh, the Jewish people, but there would be those who did respond. They would be, there would be a changed people. And we see in the first century, Acts chapter two, men and brethren, what shall we do? Thousands were added to the church on that day and thousands more in the days and months and years that would follow as the gospel was spread and people believed it and they turned to the truth. Now, throughout history, it is not the majority that walk with God, but there is a remnant. There are those who will embrace God and follow Him. And this is the picture of God seeing and saying, look at what it's going to be like in the future. They're going to reverence me. They're going to serve me faithfully. And they're going to understand my will. Verse 24, the last verse of this chapter. These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding. Those who complained will learn doctrine. So uh, they, they once did not know, they didn't grasp, they couldn't understand, but that will all change. They will seek me out and they will know me in, a, in the true sense of that. And those who complained, so this was an attitude, you know, we had the people oftentimes coming out of Egypt, they did it over and over again, murmuring against God, complaining, grumbling. They didn't have the heart that they should. That will shift as well. They will learn doctrine. They will have a different heart toward God. All of that is good. So we live in the times, of course, of the Christian age. We live in the time where our, our, our glad tidings, our message of joy is come to Christ for salvation. His church exists. Uh, he died for it. He has brought about hope for you, every individual. Salvation can be yours. You can be saved and have hope of eternal life. Know that God is with you here and now and will help you through the struggles of this life and that you are part of a Christian family that you can receive support from. It's all a wonderful thing that God has provided here and now, but it's not an easy life and we have to be those who choose to be the work of God's hands. Allow Him to work on our lives through His Word to allow ourselves to you know, change, to not harden our hearts against God, but instead to, to humbly serve Him and to keep the mindset, the attitude that whatever God says is what I want to do and I want to be active and I want to serve Him. I want Christianity to be my life, not just what I profess to be a part of and, you know, Sundays and Wednesdays I'm present, but it, it, it affects how we live what we look like spiritually to the people all around us, that we don't look like the world, but we look like Christ, and that we, our mindset, our priorities are spiritually focused, 
that we give ourselves to the daily study of God's Word and teaching that Word to our children, to our grandchildren, or passing it on to the next generation, making ourselves aware of the dangers that are out here, uh, warning uh, others, family, and, and our brethren about them, and uh, fighting the fight together, and sowing the seed together, and doing all the work that God has given us to do, because we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord, and that we have wonderful things to look forward to, and that our God will bring to pass all of His promises, and that's a reality in our future uh, that's coming one day. And so beautiful words from Isaiah here concerning good days that would come, and uh, we live in the wonderful time of the church, and what a blessing it is. Uh, but again, uh, let us all be active and busy in doing the great things that God has given us to do. So we didn't get into chapter 30 after all tonight, but next week we will uh, begin with chapter 30 where the, the uh, Lord corrects His people who again have placed their confidence in something other than God. And again, that's not a, a new mistake that humanity makes. It happens oftentimes today as well when we don't put our trust in God and His Word, but in other things instead. So appreciate your attention tonight. We're having just a brief break and then we'll have our devotion. It's good to see everyone out uh, this afternoon. It's good to have our visitors with us. If you're in our area come Sunday, where our Bible study is at 9 o'clock, our worship service at 10, and our second service is at 1 o'clock. So, like I said, it's good to have everyone out with us here tonight. Uh, I'll run through the, the announcements here fairly quickly. Uh, Don and I would like to thank everyone for the cards and kind words and everything that's been done for us and the passing of her mom. Um, we're going to have a memorial service for Mary Shepherd down in Alabama on the 23rd of July. So we'll be heading out of town for that. Also, uh, Randy's uh, mom, uh, Diane, she does, ha she does have uh, breast cancer and she is facing uh, surgery and maybe chemo. They haven't decided everything that's, that she, that's going to happen happen for her yet, so let's keep her in her prayers. Also, uh, Courtney and Dean uh, have pretty much recovered from the uh, COVID. They're still on the weak side, so let's keep both of them in their prayers. And also Antoinette and Brian Ramsey as they deal with COVID. 
uh, Dave Barber and Harley McClung and Savannah Plants. Let's keep all three of these individuals in our prayers as well. Uh, this coming Sunday will be our uh, potluck, our fellowship lunch. So let's keep that, keep that on our calendar. And also uh, July the 16th will be our fellowship night. Also, Polishing the Pulpit will be here in August the 17th through the 25th, so let's keep this on our calendars as well. Uh, Randy will be leading us in song tonight, and Kevin will be uh, bringing a de devotional to us. All right, it's first song, number 680. <clears throat> There's not a friend. <clears throat> Let's all sing. There's not a friend like the Lord Jesus. No. song is number 744. Jesus in his uh, Sermon on the Mount gave many teachings that would be so valuable and helpful to the people not only of those times but continue to benefit humanity and guide us in the way that is right and alert us to things that we need to be aware of and, and watchful of. He used a lot of different uh, examples in, in nature to, uh, to teach people as well. We, you know, when we go out, maybe hiking in the mountains, uh, there's a lot of different plants actually that you could just pick and eat, the leaves. Uh, there's a lot of uh, wild edibles that are out there. You're surrounded by them when you go out places. It's just that you don't know them. You don't recognize them because you haven't learned what they look like. Just like you go to the grocery store, that says lettuce or that says kale or whatever, and you grab it, uh, you, you can recognize things by what they look like, and that tells you something about it. Is it harmful, poison ivy, or is it something that I can take and I can eat and, and I'm going to benefit from it? Well, Jesus taught something to his followers using this kind of reasoning beginning in, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. He says, You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So he's given warning. It's no different today than it was then in the sense that there will always be voices, uh, individuals, uh, groups, whatever it may be, 
that are sending out dangerous messages, hurtful messages. He says, you will know them by their fruits. In other words, what actually comes out of them? What actually are they like? By, you can hear what they say for themselves. You can hear what they stand for, what they advocate, what they teach. You'll know by what they say as to what they are. But here's the problem. Would you actually be able to do that if you didn't know what true and right and what was proper is? Because if you have nothing to base that on, uh, it'll be very difficult to do. We know the difference, for example, between different types of fruits or various bushes. Uh, we have in our background, a, a backyard, a bull thistle in an area of the, of the, of the backyard that isn't being mowed. And, and it's getting up huge, it's getting up tall, and there's all kinds of prickly things all over it. We wouldn't go and, and take that and eat that. It's, it's not for that purpose. You know things based upon what you see and what you've learned, and God's Word is the standard and the guidebook, the light or lamp to our feet and light to our path that will lead us to heaven. Knowing it is critical so that we can then recognize what doesn't match up with it. You can hear all kinds of teachers and people speaking things. I mean, now more than ever, probably in any other time of history, information is available. We're overloaded with it. You know, you have information at your fingertips because you can pull out your phone and you can access any information, you know, from all over the world. And most of it, most of it is not going to be, and in terms of religious instruction, is not going to be that which reflects God and His Word accurately portrayed. And so, and yet a lot of people are exposed to things that to them, because they don't know God's Word, sound okay. You know, a person is going to speak and he's going to represent what he gives you as an apple, this is good for you, eat it. But how will you know if that's one or not if you haven't been trained by God's Word to know what an apple, so to speak, actually looks like? God's Word shows us what is good, what is acceptable, what is right, what actually comes from God. And therefore we know what we can and should eat and partake of and what is dangerous to take and to partake of spiritually. We need today to remind ourselves to enter into a systematic study of God's Word that we never cease from. That's every Christian. And today, think about it, we have resources like probably no other time in history. You know, you can get on the internet, and you can go to places like World Video Bible School, and you can, you can take courses there. I mean, extensive courses like you might take at a school of preaching or in a uh, you know, very rigorous class, and you can learn a tremendous amount, book by book in the Bible, and grow in your understanding of God's Word. So you can access a teacher any time of day. Why not do something like that? You know, we have written resources, Apology Express, and they have videos too in terms of uh, defending uh, against erroneous doctrines and ideas that are changing the fabric of our society, of our nation. Uh, they, have, they have parts of their website that deal with, um, you know, issues relating to America and what we're facing as a nation. They have doctrinal issues. They have the apologetics in terms of creation evolution, all different segments that present a lot of valuable material. They have material for your kids that you could use in homeschooling and all sorts of things like that because there's a desperate need. We are greatly blessed to have God's Word present with us and to be able to access it ourselves and study it is such a blessing because there is so much, this word is popular today, misinformation religiously in our world today. There's a lot of... Uh, fake news, not good news, being spread because the doctrines and teachings of men aren't reality and they will not lead anyone to heaven. But they are tragically misleading many people who think they're on the right path but who aren't. Uh, and so our job is to recognize for our own safety the false prophets of the world and also to warn others and help to try to bring them back. Not everyone will listen. That's just the way it is. But we should love them, care for them, reach out to them, 
and take to heart the, the, the warning of Jesus. And remember, we can't save others if we can't save ourselves in terms of recognizing right from wrong, truth from error. Uh, and that only happens when we spend a lot of time right here investigating, growing, studying, and maturing in our faith. And so Jesus' words are important. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. You need to know them because they are those who appear like sheep, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They'll harm you. They'll harm your children. They will harm your grandchildren. And you must be able to recognize them and warn all around of them. The Lord's wonderful word guides us in the path that is right. He has so much to teach us. And this evening as you reflect upon your own life, are you one who has turned to God in full faith, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, realizing that you also have to turn away from a sinful life with a penitent heart, turn to God, confess your faith in Jesus Christ, acknowledging Him to be the Savior. And then, of course, God has commanded, Jesus made it clear during His ministry, that we have to be baptized in order to be saved. It's one of God's commandments. Uh, the idea that it's some kind of a work and contributes to salvation, that's a misunderstanding of the kind of works that God prohibits. The works that God commands, everyone has to do them, all of them. And that's a part of being faithful to God. And certainly, baptism is a part of our salvation because it's where the blood of Christ is applied to us. And then the life that we live, so important, faithfulness to the Lord. It's going to be a hard life. We know it. Jesus prepared us for that uh, very truth. It's a difficult life to live, but one that rewards us with an eternal crown that will never be taken away from us. If you're not yet a Christian, we can help you tonight. But if you are a child of God and have strayed and need to come home, we'd be glad to pray for you, whatever your needs are, as we stand and sing. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day of our lives. Thankful for your, for your Son, in whom we have salvation and forgiveness of our sins. Thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have the hope of heaven as our, as our home. We pray, Heavenly Father, for your care upon the sick that's been mentioned here tonight. Be with those families that have lost loved ones and comfort them. Help us, Heavenly Father, to read and to study and know of your word that we can direct our steps and we can help others. Help us always, Heavenly Father, seek to teach your word, do those things which are right. It's in Christ's name, amen.